Cool. So, thank you. Uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speakers, Jordi and Tillman, who are going to be speaking about Cyan, the next inter uh, generation internet. Can we get a round of applause, please? Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for attending the talk. Thanks to the host for having us here. And, well, I'm a little bit of a rock star right now. Um, so yeah, we are uh, Till and Jordi. Uh, we both uh, come from um, ETH Zurich. Uh, we are part of the um, network security group at ETH Zurich. And we are also part of the Scion uh, open source implementation team. So um, first question, who has heard before about Scion? OK, some people. OK, so you can skip the introduction and the overview. Um, OK, so for the rest, I will start uh, introducing what Scion is. So um, Scion is a clean design of an uh, interdomain uh, architectures that consider security from design to achieve um, security properties, mainly availability, also transparency and control, reliability, and, and scalability. So I want to make here clear that um, Scion has to do with the interdomain network, so it doesn't have anything to do with interdomain protocols or higher level protocols in that sense. Um, and the other thing I want to um, highlight on this slide is that um, Scion is an open source project. So here you have the uh, GitHub repo in uh, which you can find the uh, reference uh, implementation of Scion. So in here you have also, well, Till will give more details afterwards. Here you can find uh, also references to documentation and, and um, related stuff. So the second question is, why does even Cyan exist? So um, Cyan comes as an alternative to our old friend, BGP IP internet. Um, so yes, this was created even before I was born. So imagine how things have changed so far. Um, so Cyan has the, the um, distinct aspect that incorporates those security aspects I mentioned before from the very inception. Um, why do we need this? So, because we need a network that provides uh, availability even under the presence of malicious actors because there are people interested in there in harming the um, interdomain routing. So we can uh, we can find some examples, uh, current recent examples. So for example, an outage caused um, to a, a Spanish ISP due to a BGP attack. Um, and we have uh, several malicious actors in internet, unfortunately, from um, nation state actors uh, to, um, uh, to um, cyber um, criminal groups that are interesting. In, interested in uh, harming um, and uh, due to different reasons, right? They, they can be from political reasons to economic uh, incentive, um, you can name it. And uh, yes, sometimes the trust boundaries, so trust nature of the current uh, routing um, uh, architecture, sometimes doesn't make it clear enough uh, where the trust boundaries are. So probably some of you are hungry, um, maybe not enough for just running away and grabbing lunch. Um, so I cannot offer you food, like real actual food, but I can offer you some uh, yummy desserts. In this case, towards the end of the presentation, we will give a, or we will present a couple of uh, demos. One is a, a browsing demo using Scion. Second one is a um, Cyan Word uh, first-person shooter, and finally we we well Tillman uh, will walk you through um, steps and guidelines uh, for developers that hopefully find this uh, interesting and want to contribute or um, just use uh, what's there so far. But 
first some uh, overview of Scion. Um, so the whole Scion ecosystem uh, includes uh, different entities from different domains, so from research institutions to ISPs, um, to vendors and integrators and users of the system. All, all this ecosystem is nurtured by the Scion Association, which is a non-profit organization um, responsible for the standardization of the Scion protocols. They are currently pushing and they have published uh, three or four ITF drafts and they are pushing it to uh, RFCs. Um, so, uh, yeah, they are also responsible for uh, managing the, the, open source, uh, the open source implementation. So, here I try to summarize Scion in five distinct aspects. Um, the first one is that Scion is a pathware internet architecture, meaning that um, end hosts are presented with path information in the network and they can make a choice of uh, what path they use to send the, their traffic through. The second aspect is that uh, Scion um, designs and implements a scalable trust infrastructure. Uh, I will go into a little bit more detail just in the next slide. Um, it also um, designs and implements uh, scalable path discovery, basically um, in the control plane for uh, trying to achieve rapid, uh, rapid global connectivity. Then another aspect is that it has like multipath nature. So um, as I said before, end hosts are presented with several paths that they can use even simultaneously. And finally, another aspect uh, I would like to highlight in here is that there is already um, real world deployment uh, of Scion. So this I will show you uh, towards uh, the end uh, or the middle of the presentation. So first, uh, just some terminology. So my idea here is that you kind of get the idea or the gist of it, so you are not completely abstract in this. Um, so first term is that Scion organizes itself in trust, in so-called trust isolation domains, or ISDs for short. Um, these trust domains, uh, as the name indicates, are isolated trust, so are nothing else that group of ASs of autonomous uh, systems that share a common uh, trust route configuration. So they basically agree on uh, a set of routing policies um, um, that they want to, that they want to um, use. And the other term uh, here um, is the core ASs, which are the ones uh, in charge of managing, meaning updating those TRCs and, and so on. And, this, and they also provide peering with other um, ISDs. So basically, they isolate trust. This is an important point I want to emphasize. This isolate trust. It's not other, another kind of isolation. Um, then uh, the other part of the overview is the control plane. And so here I will explain briefly how the control plane and the path dissemination looks like. So again, this is an overview of code. This is full of details, and you will find them in the documentation and references to, to the books and several papers that uh, we have about this. So, um, the routing information is disseminated to the network in these so-called beacons, which are these squares, these colors of squares in here. Those beacons are um, initiated from these core ASs that I mentioned before, and they are either propagated uh, farther down the network in the local ISD, and they are also propagated between these core ASs. These beacons are authenticated um, and extended at every hop, and um, every hop, meaning every AS, on path decide how they extend this, uh, these beacons. So they do it based on only their local policies. So yeah, basically, in the on the slides you see that they are disseminated. And um, finally, um, you have found uh, some uh, path information, you have uh, already um, those segments, um, sorry, those beacons have been disseminated and at the very moment they reach uh, an AS and here we can focus on the, on the green ones, for example, 
those are already usable. So there is no need for convergence in that sense. So this piece of information is already directly usable. Um, this uh, helps to achieve rapid path exploration and scalability. As I said before, this is just a quick overview because I, I don't want to overwhelm with details. But there is uh, exhaustive evaluation on this scalability on this scalability aspect of the control plane on the, of the control plane system. Um, one other aspect I mentioned before is the multipath nature of Scion. So, um, from the uh, end host perspective, um, end host uh, retrieve path information from their uh, local ASs. So basically, um, they request this path information and they are uh, basically, they retrieve several paths they can use simultaneously. So um, the path uh, server, so-called the service in the local AS that provides this information will provide to the end host this information. So this is different from source routing. So here, end host directly retrieves the path uh, from their local uh, AS. Um, this uh, many paths or several paths uh, allows for uh, allows applications for optimizing on different metrics. So they might find some of those paths better in terms of latency than others, uh, others better in terms of uh, bandwidth, and uh, they may hopefully find a path that uh, better suits um, their their needs, the application or end host needs. So. Um, just for putting some numbers in here, uh, in, the current, in the current production network, so the real fabric we are building, um, if you take uh, uh, two ASs, you will find uh, from dozens to even hundreds of paths that uh, can be used uh, to reach um, the other endpoint. And Last slide on this overview uh, is this uh, control plane and data plane uh, slide. So the control plane is what I have just explained in the, in the previous slides, and the data plane is what I will try to explain right now. So as I said before, uh, end host retrieve those path, seg path segments from um, local service, and they combine them to create a path. So you can find here two examples of paths. So segments um, are combined in one path for packet one and in another different path for uh, packet two. So um, once uh, the end host has encapsulated this information into the packet, they send it out to the network. And routers forward packet based on inspecting, uh, based on the path information. So they inspect this path information, which contains information of, okay, what's, uh, which one is the next hop? and uh, then routers can simply forward to, to this next hop. So this allows for uh, simple routers and stateless operations. So and uh, as you can see in here, so for example, those packets may belong to the same application, for example, and um, you send the packets, or the end host in this case, send the packets using two different paths that in this case are even disjoint. So, for example, this can be useful uh, if you have um, an application, it has a control channel, it can use low latency path for control channel and a higher bandwidth path uh, for um, the real application data. Okay, now, um, so, I want you all, I want to also convey the idea that there is already some tangible stuff, so it's not uh, as I said before, this is not only a research project, of course there is a lot of research in it, but there is uh, real deployment en engineering uh, right now already in, in, in Scion. So for that, uh, I will uh, basically explain um, these two networks. So first one is the uh, actual, the global Scion internet, so the, the real production network in that sense, so the real fabric. And I will just uh, introduce briefly um, some uh, concrete ISDs in this case, those color bubbles that uh, I showed at the beginning. And then I will also talk briefly about SciLab Testbed Network, which is a completely separated network. In this case, this is an overlay network that anyone can use. 
then I will give uh, more details afterwards. So, uh, in general, this production network, again, is this is not an overlay network, it's the real fabric, is BGP free. And uh, it's currently deployed by several international ISPs, so here you have some logos, you don't have to look at them. Um, currently, there are over 100 ASs, and they are uh, distributed uh, in Switzerland, you find a few of them, also in the EU, in North America, or in Asia. And the other thing about the production network is that recently uh, also has been uh, enabled Scion Cloud based access. In this case, this is, this is a commercial offering. But so yeah, just for you to know that if anyone happens to have like um, uh, cloud deployments, they can also access the, um, the production network. Um, Okay, this is one of the examples. This is uh, one ISD, again, one of the um, these um, colored bubbles that they show you at the beginning. Um, this is uh, the Education and Research ISD. Sierra is the fancy name. Um, and here you, you find um, university, uh, universities. Um, uh, in this case, here you have uh, some of those. Um, this is a growing ISD, so it's not closed, so more universities uh, may come, and some are interested in, in coming in. Um, there are also other research institutions and uh, research and education networks that uh, also provide connectivity between uh, those uh, uh, research entities. So here is a world map picture of uh, how um, they are distributed uh, roughly uh, around around the world and then very shortly there are also industry uh, industry use cases right now so there is this secure in Switzerland are, are those uh, two that I'm going to introduce the first one is the secure Swiss finance network so they are basically um, using Scion uh, uh, and they are going to phase out um, the finance IP net that they are using and by June this year, and uh, by then they will have, or the network will have around 120 participants. And the other example, similar to the Swiss, to the Secure Swiss Finance Network, is the um, Secure Swiss uh, Healthcare Network um, that provides a similar service for uh, health prof professionals. Um, so yeah, that was the real production network and this is Sciolab, which is uh, the, the research network. In this case, Sciolab is a globally distributed testbed um, to conduct experiments and test deployments. So um, this, uh, anyone can join, so anyone in the audience can join the, this network just by downloading a virtual machine. So with a background file, you run background app and then you have your node. Uh, attached to one of these uh, transit nodes. So all of those are transit nodes, leaf nodes are not in here. Um, and yeah, basically I'm not that interested in the names, so I, they may be a, re a little bit unreadable, but um, different boxes are located in different, in different parts of the world. So for example, you have Korea, you have North America, and also EU. So yeah, Tillman will also give some uh, pointers uh, uh, afterwards uh, uh, where you can find the, the information for, for joining um, SILAP. So uh, now um, we also have an uh, awesome uh, science project. So basically this is a compilation of uh, projects uh, that um, are uh, related with science. So we have from infrastructure projects, so we have um, people implementing Scion in Tofino routers, also in Express routers. We also have um, uh, firewalls uh, using Scion and uh, other kind of infrastructure related projects. We also have application projects. So we have the Scion Enable Browser extension, for example, um, in Chromium. And uh, we also have, uh, so far, a Scion Aware Quake 3. Um, video game, uh, video game client in this sense, and um, of course we also have the libraries. 
We have pointers to the reference implementation again to um, network APIs and client uh, and host stack in uh, different languages. So we have uh, in Go, then we have um, this uh, uh, client libraries for um, Java that uh, Till will uh, give some more information and explanation uh, just right now. We also have a client and host uh, in Rust and bindings to, to other uh, languages like C, C++, and Python. Then uh, also this list includes uh, uh, useful tools. So Scion is integrated in the Seed emulator. So if you're using Seed emulator, you can also bring up your Scion network. Um, then there is also Scapy libraries for packet generation and Wireshark plugins for uh, packet capturing. So here is the first demo I want to show to you. I will just switch to the video. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Okay. So uh, this is the um, the Scion browser um, demo, uh, and basically here you will see. So the first first of all, um, this uses the uh, production network. So you will see. This basically browsing in the in the production network. Uh, this is part already uh, I just said of these uh, awesome uh, projects in which we have projects uh, of uh, so different projects using Scion. So in here you can find uh, this extension. Um, you load one Scion enabled website. In this case, for example, the ETH uh, website, and uh, the extension provides some information about. Um, Yes, uh, the resources and where they were loaded from. So here you see that uh, the resources from the ETH domain were uh, loaded uh, via Scion, so the green indicates Scion, and red indicates that they fall back to VGPIP. Of course, this is configurable, and you could choose not to fall back to anything if they are not available. Here you have some path information. You see that we stay within the Swiss ISD, so my client in this case, is in the Swiss uh, in the Swiss um, in the Swiss ISD, so we stay in there um, because the server happens to be located in the in the same ISD. Then an example of navigating to another ISD. In this case, we navigate to the uh, Magdeburg University uh, server, and in here we see that uh, resources are loaded, all of them via Scion, and we have also some path information. So here we see that we go from the Swiss ISD where my client is to the this Sierra education network that I presented before. So here you find uh, the exact ASS that the uh, AS numbers that the um, traffic uh, traverses. So um, yeah, here I, I type yet another example. And yeah, basically also we have more path information. This uh, this resource also happens to be um, located in the same ISD in a different. In a, if you read it, you find different ISs, but this is not important information. So yeah, basically that will be it. Now this is just again for just showing that uh, we fall back to BGPIP, but this I already explained. And. The second demo I wanted to show is this uh, Quake 3 demo. So here, this demo is using uh, the Scion Lab testbed network, so it's not using the the, um, the production the production network. And here, our client is located in in uh, Node at ETH in uh, Zurich, and we connect to the server which is located in Magdeburg, Germany. Um, we connected to the server. And okay, so basically here, what so you, you will see um, commands being typed. The piece of information I want to convey is um, that uh, so different things that we have is this show paths command that's Scion specific, and this show path command show all available paths from the client to the to the server. So you get a bunch of paths and. Uh, well, we uh, see a little bit more of them. And the other thing is that 
for demonstration purposes, what we do is we bind uh, to, to the key the command next path. So then we can iterate basically and see how different paths uh, provide different latencies. So we have this key shortcut. And while we are playing, you will see on the top left of the screen, not right now, but while we are playing. So this path, for example, um, so if you saw it before, this path had uh, 100 milliseconds latency. We start playing. And then what I was saying before is that uh, now, for example, you see in the top left corner, we have uh, switched the path. So we just press this, uh, this key shortcut. And we we iterate over over the the set of available paths. So this is for demonstration purposes, for so that we can find paths with different latencies. We keep iterating. Uh, we see uh, changes in latency. We see we keep iterating on the top left part of the of the of the screen. And yes, uh, basically we see these different latencies. So hopefully this will stop now in the last frame. And here for this specific path, we received this uh, latency. So this is interactive. Of course, you can program this and adapt your application to have a path selection algorithm that does it automatically and always uh, takes the path with best latency. Um, and yes, that, that was it. I will now let the floor to Till for explaining the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Jordi. Um, so now let's imagine you found all the science stuff very interesting and you um, try to implement your own project. Um, how would you go about that? Yeah, the first uh, step would be to go to this um, awesome science list that uh, Jordi presented earlier where you can find existing projects, but also uh, libraries, language libraries to um, connect to the science network. So these are probably the most important ones for a new project. The first one here is the Go API. That's like the reference implementation, the original implementation of Cyan. It's the most comprehensive implementation. It contains everything, including border routers, uh, control servers, and everything you need to completely run Cyan. It also comes with language bindings for C, C++, and Python. Um, more recently, we have a Rust API, 100% written in Rust. And just released a few days ago, we have an alpha version uh, of the Java API. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, because that's kind of the project I'm involved in, the Java API. So yeah, it's written in 100% pure Java. It is very similar to the datagram channel that people may know from Java, um, yeah, with a few exceptions. Datagram socket is currently not implemented, but that's very pretty much the next thing to do in our list, especially since I realized that a lot of existing older projects rely on datagram socket instead of datagram channel. The library also has an API for path inspection. This is pretty much all what science is about. Uh, science is about. You kind of um, get a lot of paths from your AS and you select the best path for your purpose. So yeah, path inspection and selection is uh, very essential. It also supports the SCMP uh, protocol. SCMP is like ICMP for Cyan. So you, again, you have uh, echo or ping and trace root commands available. So let's look at a very basic Java client. So this is a datagram channel example. and Basically, there's nothing to see here because it looks exactly like you would use a normal datagram channel. The one thing to yeah, just bear in mind is, for example, the host name, ethat.ch, that needs to be a sign enabled host, otherwise you can't run that example. And also your local machine needs to be somehow connected to the sign network. Uh, let's look at a bit more interesting example. So there's an additional method there are several ones, but this is one uh, that may be interesting. It's called set path policy. So what you can do, of course, is just go through all the paths that you get here from your local ISP, your, your local AS, and then pick the ones that you want to use. But it's much easier if you can just define a path policy. In that case, maximum bandwidth. You set that path policy on your channel, and the channel will always try to find a path um, that yeah, suits this path policy. 
Now we're going to look at the server side. That's a little bit different from the native Java implementation in the sense that uh, the receive doesn't return the inet socket address but a path object. And the path object does contain the inet socket address from the client that connected to the server, uh, but it also contains the whole path that the packet actually um, took through the internet. And you can just use this path then to send a response back to the client. The idea here in sign is that usually if you send a packet to a server, you would send it back the exactly same route. So technically you don't have to do that, but it makes, a lot easier, makes it a lot easier for the server because the server doesn't have to look up paths, how to connect to a client, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, much faster. So um, I mentioned path policies before. Uh, the Java library comes with some predefined path policies. They are well, somewhat self-explanatory probably, but uh, yeah, one path policy is called first that just picks the first path that your AS gives you back when you ask it for a, a path to a certain destination. Um, that's kind of a cheap way for the AS to actually recommend you a path if they think that's the path you should use. The next one is minhop that just tries to find the shortest path, so with the more uh, the least hops in the path, and hop being like a border router or other ASs you have to go through. Then there is min latency and max bandwidth, which also pretty much do what you would expect them to do, except that these uh, implementations are non-parameterized; they're static, so they just rely on metadata. So you ask your AS for a path, you get metadata back that kind of estimates the latency and give you like the allocated bandwidth for the cert for the links in the path. If you want to have like really the best latency, you would need to implement a new filter, or I may also provide that in the future, um, a new filter that looks at all the paths, pings all the paths, and then just selects the one that has the um, lowest latency. Um, at the bottom of the list, we have the ISD allow and ISD disallow filters. ISD being the isolation domain um, numbers that we previously saw, although this whole uh, set of ASs. So basically, isolation domains can map to countries, for example, or to something like the university um, network uh, that we saw earlier. So these ISD allow and disallow can be used to implement something like geofencing. Um, and since the ISDs represent countries, for example, you can decide that you don't want your packets to go through a certain country. So imagine you're on the bottom left ISD in one of those ASs in that ISD, and you want in your ISD is 110, and you want to send to ISD 130, and there are a lot of paths, some direct paths, some go by 99, and one some paths by 125 and 120. And for some reason, you don't like ISD 99, which could be a country, could be just um, some other organization. And then you can just define your path policy like that. Um, the exact syntax is a little bit different, so I simplified it here, but it's uh, pretty much that. So you can just um, exclude 99, so the filter will pick any path that is not and that doesn't go via 99. Um, yeah, so once you wrote your application, uh, your first step, well, not the first step, but yeah, the next step is testing. And a common way to test uh, Cyan is just to run a local network on your computer, on your machine. And you can do that using the reference implementation that was mentioned earlier, the Cyan Proto reference implementation. So what you do is first you define a topology in a file a topology file, and then you run this command. This will create a lot of configuration files for all the border routers, um, control servers, daemons, and whatever needs to be started in your machine. Then you can uh, um, view the topology if you like. So we have a very simple topology here with three ASs, like the three ellipses, um, one core AS, that's the one on the top, and they all reside in the same ISD. Well, that's just a simple example. There are also a number of topologies that are already in the repository, so you don't really need to write your own if you don't uh, want to. 
Then you just run the uh, topology that will start up all the different processes for the different uh, border routers, control services. They're all connected via loopback devices. And then you can just connect with your local application to the network. In this case, I just run a ping um, to the core IST, and uh, yeah, that's the result. So there are other um, methods for testing. So there is, for example, the seed emulator that Jordi already mentioned. Um, that comes, that does support Cyan. Then there is the Cyan Lab. This is this worldwide network of Cyan nodes. And if you want to use it, you can go to the website, the register. You can uh, allocate your own ASs if you want. And then you can, yeah, as mentioned previously, download an image for a virtual machine and the virtual machine is like an AS that you run locally. Um, you can even create several of those and then create a network. Then you can uh, test in the production network, but that requires you to actually have access to the production network. So if you're lucky, your ISP supports that, but there are currently not that many. Um, AWS offers nodes that have sign access, so you can rent an, in an AWS cloud center or something. Um, or maybe your university has uh, access to the Sierra network. And finally, for debugging, there's a lot of command line tools. I think I mentioned yeah, ping and trace route before, show path, and uh, several others. And there's also a very neat uh, Wireshark plugin. So you can just look at sign packets, inspect the header, look at the path that, the, that it's um, associated with the header. So, and if you want to contribute, um, there are several, yeah, tons of projects that could be done. Um, you could create your own projects, so we are still missing native libraries for C and C++, for example. There are no uh, libraries at the moment for C Sharp or Swift. Um, you could think about embedded or mobile devices. Um, also network protocols. So for example, the Java implementation currently only supports UDP. We aim to use um, uh, support Quick and pro uh, probably TCP very soon, but uh, there are many other protocols that would need uh, support. Um, yeah, or you can just use one of the big existing projects for web proxies, HTTP servers, or video conferencing clients like Jitsi or something, or gaming libraries and try to make them sign aware so you can select path or automatically select good path uh, in these uh, projects. So, yeah, finally, if you want help um, or support, there's a sign uh, Slack channel, there's a matrix channel, and since last week we also have a sign tag on Stack Overflow so you can tag your question with sign and we have some developers subscribe to the tag and they will try to answer your questions. Um, yeah, that's already from my side everything. Thank you and uh, looking forward to some questions. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I have uh, uh, my question is uh, regards uh, security and pr protection against DOS attack. So you allow uh, everybody to select a path uh, for packets, uh, and uh, how, how do you protect against uh, someone doing it maliciously? Uh, for example, uh, sending uh, packets back and forth between ASs to overload the network. Yeah. So. Um the question was, I think, uh, um, how you prevent DDoS attacks or how to prevent people abusing paths to send traffic forth, creating loops, for example. So these paths that you can see here, they all signed. So they, um, that makes it kind of impossible to create your own path. The paths are all signed by all the ASs on the way. Um, and that also makes it a bit easier to prevent DDoS attacks because you know where a packet came from. And if you don't like that region, you can quite simply block everything that comes from that region. Thanks. Yes. Well.
Uh, I think a question is somewhat in a similar vein. How, you, how do you deal with uh, resiliency of the network, which with uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, re oh yeah the speakers? <laughs> how do you deal with resilience? Uh, like the internet is very resilient because the routers can take independent decisions. But if you select a path as a user and like a link goes down, then like it has, like inform that information has to disseminate all the way back to the user so they can select a new route and then uh, have their link up again instead of that just happening transparently to the user. Um, so, okay, the point here is that normally you send the packet out to the network, right? and just pick uh, routers to send it to the next hop, just based on the destination information, right? So when you have, for example, some link failing in the middle, you need to converge to an, a stable state in which, okay, what's now the after the failure, what's the next router I have to send the packets to? So this, is, this takes some time. And by that time, your packet may be time out already. So you need to still resend the packet. So with Scion, you can already detect that when you see that the packet is taking long or you don't get feedback. And you can already take, for example, a completely disjoint path. And in that sense, this failover mechanism is quite effective. This is also So normally when link is busy, you also get network feedback, right? So you, you see that packets are thinking longer, latency is increasing. So what you do is you as a user, you are interested in taking a more healthy path in that sense, if I can say that. So you will automatically switch to that path. I have, I have a question you showed in your API example that the, when you create a connection, you specify the route. but Supposedly, a country changes. Uh, you don't want to go. You want your packet to go through a certain country. Then you have to change your software. Or currently, when I make a connection, I only specify the destination, and I don't care how it gets there. But now the information of how it gets there is mixed with where it should go. So when the route changes, I need to change my client software. I, if I understand correctly. Um, and yeah, I hope I understood the question. So um, the routers are become very simple because they don't need to do any decisions anymore. The only thing is they could verify whether the path is um, assigned path. So yes, you do have to update your clients. The clients all need new libraries that could be, I mean, I have a quite high level library with the Java, but it could be an operating system, just another driver that sits underneath UDP or TCP and um, adds like the science path transparently. But yeah, that's kind of the big work. We have to provide updates for the clients, I think. Uh, let me add five cents. So there are also uh, transition mechanisms, right? So we have, for example, a thing uh, so-called Scion IP gateway. So there, for example, uh, traditional IP application. So you have your applications in a certain subnet, and this traffic gets to this uh, Scion IP gateway. And this Scion IP gateway encapsulates traffic uh, to the Scion network. So in that sense, you don't need to change, for example, with this transition mechanism, you don't need to change uh, your application. Of course, the application is not taking like the uh, best properties in that sense. For example, then you would not be as application choosing your path and optimizing for all of those or, or for some of those metrics, but you can still um, uh, let this traffic go to this specific gateway and then this gateway will decide for, for you, depending maybe on policies and local policies, where do I send this traffic to? I, I don't mean the, the one-time conver conversion, of course, if you switch to a new uh, network protocol, you have to change your software, but it's more the dynamic stuff when now my, my provider decides if some uh, AS is out of uh, out of the loop, uh, but now I have to decide that as a as a client. Yes, but you can easily default to whatever paths your provider um, uh, provides to you. So you can always pick your default and just don't care about the rest. But on top of that, you have the choice as end host to decide where you want to send your traffic to. If your for your use case is not important, whether your traffic goes uh, through, I don't know, any country, you name it, then you can just fall back to the default paths and then you don't have uh, to make this decision, if, uh, if so. Uh, 
Um, is path selection always from the client side, or can the server make a decision of what paths are acceptable? Yeah, so the path server is usually the client would connect the path server in his AS, um, in its AS to get a selection of paths, and we would use those paths. And those paths are sent to the server, and the server could look up a different path to the client in theory, but that feels a bit ineffective, so it, they can just reverse the path, or it's automatically reversed in this API to you send the packet back. Um, yes, but just adding something else, uh, there are some projects, for example, um, that uh, try to uh, make some negotiation so the server can uh, signal or indicate the client what's the best path to choose in their opinion. But this is, this, uh, is also like uh, separate from the vanilla side and thing. But this is something you could put in place. Uh, I have a few questions, but they should be quick to answer. So I've read about this thing called Secure Backbone Autonomous System which is where you advertise better routes to uh, existing BGP infrastructure. Is this uh, in wide deployment? Is this popular? Is it being used? Um, also, uh, have there been any experiments with Wi-Fi? Does Scion work well in wireless context? And also in the Quake example, I didn't see an IP address in the Quake demo. I saw some other sort of address. What is that address? It's like uh, the ISD or something. So uh, I, I got the first and the last uh, question, so I will try to answer those first. So the first was talking about SBUS, right? So SBUS is uh, also an incremental deployment um, model architecture, which basically is a uh, hybrid between BGP and, uh, and Scion. So in that sense, uh, the idea, very basic idea, and uh, I'm not the one like involved in that project, but very basic idea is that um, you combine BGP so that uh, BGP are announced closer to this backbone, and then uh, you use this backbone as secure backbone, and then you go out to the internet again, hopefully close to the to the um, to the destination. So the uh, a specific question was about the current deployment. So it's under deployment. So um, uh, some members in our team are making efforts, and this, I would say, should be soonish already to be used in, in production. It's not here, yet there, but it's there. And the last question was about the address format, right? So yes, the address format that you saw uh, is composed of the ISD, so this color bubble, NAS, uh, the individual AS um, um, of, the, of this ISD. So these two numbers, um, plus the end host, um, the end host address. This end host, end host address has a scope within the autonomous system. So um, you could use basically any address you, would, you want, but uh, the scope of this end host address is specific to this um, a specific autonomous system, which is indicated by the uh, ISD plus AS uh, numbers. There was just one more question about wireless. Is there any experiments with wireless? Uh, has anyone done anything? Um, so now we will be starting projects for supporting um, Scion in Android. And there we are going to uh, go deeper on that. But of course, I mean, for example, if you are interested in providing um, wireless support, and uh, and optimize for wireless design use case. I mean, you you are more than welcome. But yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is: uh, You mentioned earlier at the presentation that uh, there is a way to update ASs, which nodes which uh, which nodes can be trusted with the further routing. So my question is, how does that work? Uh, who decides which nodes can, rep can act as ASs, which ones cannot, and how the, those bigger bubbles, so ISPs or something else, whatever it's called, uh, how do you decide which nodes act as uh, ASs, and uh, can you dynamically update it? Um, so if I understood the question correctly, it's about who decides what AS uh, is trustable or not trustable, right? So um, 
So what Sion brings is this possibility to the sender, in this case the end host within the AS. Uh, as I said before, your AS will provide you with a set of paths and then you will, based on your local uh, policies as end host, you will apply these policies to this uh, set of paths and then um, you will end up having a subset of uh, paths that you consider that are good for your use cases. So um, this, of course, brings, uh, so this delegates some uh, responsibility, but this is good. I mean, at the end, as I uh, answered before, you can fall back to any default path, right? And just be kind of agnostic to, okay, my, where my packet is going to. But, I mean, the main benefit is just uh, having a, a choice on that. So ISDs basically represent jurisdictions, right? So you can think about them. For example, we have the Swiss ISD we will have other countries' ISDs or regions. Or in this case, for example, this group of uh, university institutions. So you may think, so in there it's pretty much, uh, for my use case, for example, I would uh, want my traffic only go through research institutions because I'm deploying this thing from maybe my home country. And then I could basically steer that policy or uh, implement that policy. Uh, in there, and then of all the sets of available paths, I will be doing that. Of course, it will, this will depend maybe on your application. For doing certain things, you are good with other paths. So I don't know if I... Ah, the initial trust routes, so they are agreed upon. So basically... Can we take this offline so we can get the next speaker? Please. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can you. answer you offline because they, they need to. Hallway track, it's a thing. <laughs> okay, thank you for the talk. Thank you.